right, everybody. It is another Thursday live stream here with Green with Envy. We're going to continue the talks about the Drew Holiday extension. There's only three games left in the regular season, and the East is still all types of a disaster below the Celtics. So we're going to look at all the different playoff scenarios and see if we can figure out what is the ideal playoff path for the Boston Celtics. All that and more coming up next here on Green with Envy. Let's lock in. What up, what up, what up? Welcome into another edition of Green with Envy. It is a Thursday live stream, the last live stream of the regular season. Celtics will wrap up their season Sunday afternoon against the Washington Wizards. Also, sadly, Mike Gorman's last call on the mic. So we'll definitely have some coverage for you after that game, talking about Mike Gorman, as well as getting into all the playoff breakdown. So be on the lookout for that. The Celtics, as we're recording this tonight, have uh, two games before that, including one against the New York Knicks. And we're going to look at all the different playoff scenarios that's going on in the East. And of course, we already recorded a podcast about Drew Holiday's extension, but we do want to make sure we continue that conversation. So as you're getting in here to this live stream, start to drop your questions in the chat. Let us know what you're thinking. I'm your boy, Will Weir. And of course, riding shotgun, we got my best friend, co-host, and the coach of our podcast, the one and only Greg Manakis. How you doing today, man? I'm good. I made the mistake last night of looking at the YouTube comments. I never look at the YouTube comments because it always just like sends me down a rabbit hole. But I want to give a personal apology to Landon Lakes, who commented that I needed to put some clothes on because I was wearing my basketball outfit after the game last night. And Landon said, like, Greg, showing off a lot of skin there. So I made sure today <laughs> I'm wearing a little bit more coverage, less skin a little more tone. conservative. So Landon, this shirt was 100 percent for you. Thank you for your, there we go. your feedback. <laughs> Shout out to Landon, a good, good listener of the show here. Um, but yeah, so we hopped on last night talked a little bit about the drew holiday extension and honestly if you're joining us right now start to put some some comments in the chats i'd love to hear uh, if you're loving this deal if you have any questions about it if you're a little bit skeptical let us know because i would love to get some some more opinions i think from what i've seen so far greg and this is just based on you know looking around twitter and it it, it kind of feels like the vibes are pretty high now i think a lot of that has to do with where this team currently is and the way that Drew Holiday has produced. It's pretty hard to have too much of a of a gripe, you know, with this contract. And I think, you know, Drew Holiday even talked about it himself is that when he came to Boston and he, he talked about it on the Draymond podcast, it was all kind of a whirlwind from getting traded from Milwaukee to Portland briefly and then to Boston. But since he's gotten to Boston, it feels like once that extension eligible period came about, which was a couple days, which was earlier this month, April 1st is when it started. It felt like this was an inevitability and it, it came through in some of Drew's comments today. But I'm curious, let's start with you, Greg, before we go through some of Drew's comments. You know, you've had a little extra time to to marinate on Drew Holiday, now locked in four more years after this season concludes. How are you feeling? Any Any new opinions about this contract extension? No, I mean, I, today was me kind of just like looking around, um, checking the pulse of the rest of Celtics Twitter and, you know, checking on Adam Celtics Chronicle. Shout out to Celtics Chronicle. He had a great piece where he he asked some questions. He did a little Q&A with Keith. Um, and basically, Keith said all the same stuff that we said on the pod last night. So that made me feel pretty good about our pod because, I, you know, that was kind of instant reaction. So getting to see Keith kind of reiterate a lot of the same stuff that we were talking about on the pod last night. If you want to hear those thoughts, go back one episode on the pod feed um, or on the YouTube channel. But yeah, I feel really good about it, man. One thing I did want to pull up really quickly here. Um, this is just an estimated uh, Boston Celtics salary cap and tax workbook from uh, the legend himself, Danger Cart, Ryan Bernardoni on Twitter. I don't know if you saw this yet. Will, have you seen I this? I have not. Let's let's okay. get a live reaction to it. So this right here, he put this together. He does his own like Excel sheet that you can download or whatever. So if you're um, not following Danger Cart at Danger Cart, make sure you do. He's got some good stuff. But I want to just pull this up here and let's just adjust that. So you can kind of see this is just like, what the Celtics um, salary cap and tax would look like 
in the future, right? So some of the stuff that you see here is obviously estimations like Chris Stapps Porzingis. He just has him um, at 40 million a year in 26, 27. That's if we decide to bring it back with Porzingis. Mm -hmm. He's got Derek White extension, I think, at the max level that that extension can go to each of those years, so on and so forth. But what you'll see down the bottom is the estimated salary cap and the total salary. And then down the very bottom, the estimated tax that the Celtics would be paying yeah. um, based off of their roster. And this, we know, is a very expensive roster, but I think this is a good estimation to see how expensive this roster could be if we wanted to keep it intact. So to me, when I looked at this um, salary cap and tax workbook from our guy at Danger Cart, I just thought to myself, okay, the things we said last night about this being a two-year window are very true. And you're probably not going to see this version of the team intact when you get to 26, 27, 27, 28. There's probably going to be some moves in this, you know, yeah. when we talk about Drew Holiday's contract being a very tradable contract, um, Jalen Brown's contract being a very tradable contract, there's going to be some move. So what we need to do right now is just enjoy the window while we have it. Yeah, the looking at the estimated tax for 25 26 that number is jarring to say the least 313 million now that's factoring in you know a few other contracts we don't know what's going to happen but yeah it's like you said this year next year enjoy every single moment that you can because starting in 25 26 that's when it will really start to get super tight and it's it's going to potentially be unfeasible to keep. Now, some of this will change depending on, once again, this is estimated salary cap. So some of this can can fluctuate with whatever happens with the new CBA deal that's that's coming up here. New TV deal, I should say, is actually what's what's on the looming horizon. That's going to change a lot of the dynamics financially within the NBA. Um, but yeah, these next two years, we're locked and loaded. This playoffs, let's go. We're, let's enjoy it next year. We're good to go. We're feeling comfortable. 25, 26, 26, 27. That's when it starts to get really tough. And we're going to have to see, you know, I, I said this last night when we were recording is that, you know, Wick in that in the ownership group had said a couple of years ago, we're willing to spend if it makes sense. This team wins a championship and they're close to it. They're, they're no doubt they're they're spending as of right now. I would qualify them as a team that has lived up to their word and they are spending for a team that is championship aspiration that is right there we fully expect them to likely get through the eastern conference we'll talk more about that later but at least they're at the very top of the nba and so when you see that they're already committing they're pot committing basically i think it was 77 million for it was either next year or the year after and then when it starts to get to 300 million that's a whole different ball game we're start talking going up to that level so once you get past that that's when it's going to get a little bit dicey so the Derek White situation, I think, is probably the biggest question mark in all of this. And I saw on that sheet, and I looked this up earlier because that was something when we were live reacting, I wasn't really sure what the numbers were with Derek White. But I believe the largest extension he can get based off his current deal is somewhere in the in the ballpark of about $27 million annually, which is what Ryan had in his, uh, in his estimate. And the question is going to become for Derek White in their camp, if the Celtics do make that offer of that, 27 per per year is has Derek outplayed that if Derek goes to the open market is he going to get more my gut tells me probably so I think they're going to be in an interesting position waiting to see how that plays out and uh, I didn't get a chance to read Adam's piece yet but did they talk about that as well um, they, they didn't go too much into that. This was pretty much the only excerpt from Adam's piece on Celtics Chronicle. Make sure you're subscribing in the YouTube um, links. You should see in the description. You should see the links to that. Um, but he was just asking Keith in this Q&A. He said, with holidays contract secured, attention will turn to Derek White, who is extension eligible. Boston has White's bird rights. The question is, how much does Holiday's deal potentially impact Brad Stevens' ability to retain White as well? And Will, I'm going to ask you to play the part of Keith. All right. Let's go get this a little bit bigger because my eyes are not great. 
Retaining White is really a question for Stevens to work out with ownership. Nothing prevents Boston from signing White to whatever it will take to keep him beyond massive salary plus tax implications. All these moves are being done with the immediate and the long term in mind, but there's also a bit of let tomorrow's problems be tomorrow's problems at play here, such as life when you're trying to win a title. And I think that last part is is really true. Tomorrow's problems is tomorrow's problems. And I think especially where the Celtics know that there was a and I mentioned this last night, there's a little bit more control of where Drew Holiday is at in his career and what his financials were potentially going to look like. And, you know, he, he talked about it here in a clip that I'm going to play in just a second about, you know, his family being here and this kind of being the plan from the beginning. Whereas with Derek White, he probably has outplayed what the max extension you can get him for is. And so now you're at the mercy of he's probably going to have to do what's best for him. And that means getting to unrestricted free agency. And we're going to be limited with the type of tax restrictions that we have. And depending on who's making cap room at that time, if they want to come in for 35, 40 million. I don't, I don't know if that's going to be the case, but if someone wants to come do that, that's going to be probably too tough for the Celtics to match. So, for that reason, locking in Drew probably makes even more sense. You can, can keep a little bit of control to your environment. But let's play this clip of, of Drew Holiday here uh, for a second. And this is just him talking about the decision and basically how this was always the plan from when, when he got there. Yeah, I think there was a little uh, I think there's a little bump there in the in the beginning. Just again trying to get my bearings in the city in general. Um, but I think it comes pretty easy. Um, just the type of guy that molds to my, my situation. Um, and honestly, these players are really good. I think when you play with them, they make the game easy for you. Um, this is probably one of the most that I've got so many open shots and just really just had to lock in and knock them down. Uh, so it's been, um, like I said, maybe a little bit in the beginning, but it's been pretty easy. Uh, here, I feel like that was something that I, I wanted when I signed here. Um, obviously knowing this is my 15th year, I know, you know I mean, time is, is coming. so. I think being able to be on a team and being in an organization like this is is big for me. But I think from the beginning, this is this is a part of what I wanted. Yeah, and shout out to our friends over at CLNS for the uh, for the clip that we grabbed there. Uh, but Greg, yeah, I, I think the Celtics here giving themselves some security with what they can, and especially with Drew Holiday being seemingly all about this decision from when he got here. I think at the end of the day, even if it's Slightly more expensive. You're what are you really going to hassle over a couple two to three million here or there per year? Let's get this done and let's keep it moving. Yeah, and it's not like Drew Holiday is 35 years old right now, right? right. He's 33. Um, he's still got a few good years as 35 year as a 35 year old man, 34 year old man. You be still have those moments where you know the it doesn't feel like we're past our prime. You know, Drew's a couple of years younger than I am tip top shape as a professional athlete, he's going to be fine for the next couple of years. It really just comes down to the the tax implications that has nothing to do with Drew Holiday on the court or Drew Holiday in the locker room. Drew Holiday is a world-class teammate. He's a world-class defender. He's probably going to make all NBA defense this year and he deserves it. And he's, you know, such an upgrade over Marcus Smart as a shooter that any Celtics fans that were initially worried about that, um, how much of an upgrade is Drew over Marcus? Like we've put those questions to bed. Like Drew Holiday is a superior player over Marcus Smart on both sides of the ball. Although Marcus did, you know, he he had our heartstrings because of all the stuff Marcus Smart did. Marcus Smart wasn't shooting sixty percent from the corners, and there's just no way he was ever going to be able to do that. Drew Holiday is a perfect fit in Boston, and sometimes, you know, when when you want to keep something together, you're going to have to pay for it, and the Celtics are going to pay for it, but. I think the investment will be worthwhile because I truly think this this year the Celtics are going to win a title. They don't win it this this year, then I, I see it happening next year. Yeah, if they, if they don't win it to the point, and I, and we've been saying this since before this contract extension, it's always been a two year window. Talking about right. this year and next year before you have to make some really tough decisions, and that's when it gets to you know you you said it. I'm I'm not ready to go down this rabbit hole, but if they don't win it this year or next year. The Jalen Brown, because of the financial structure, becomes a question, even if it's not, you know, one of these one of the a scenario in which Jalen Brown is taking fault. It's just we got to keep this moving and we need to find the best way to do it. And maybe we get two twenty five million dollar guys that help us keep this moving by breaking up Jalen's contract or whatever that might, might look like. So uh, a two year window. And I think, you know, next year and years down the road, I think Drew Holiday is going to get a lot of that Al Horford type treatment. Uh, meaning you're going to see a lot of back-to-backs where maybe you don't get Drew Holiday for those particular games. Or, you know, if there's a slight, you know, 
knee contusion or you know whatever they want to label it as some back management you're going to see a few more of those labels for drew holiday um but i at the end of the day i like where this is going and the vibes are high we're in a good place for this year we're in a great place for next season and as keith said tomorrow's problems will be tomorrow's problems we will deal with that when we get there it's all about the here and now and that's the way i think you have to operate in the in this landscape of the NBA is two to three years is what you're looking at. Everything else beyond that, you'll figure it out when you get there. Look two to three years right now in the present. And then if you can grab a championship or two while you're there, you've done it really, really well. For sure. And just this, oh, I just want to pause right here really quickly. Um, just to remind everybody that's watching, this is a live stream. We do these um, Thursday live streams every Thursday at five Eastern four central. And what we'd like to do is to get a little bit of um uh, listener engagement. So if you're on YouTube or on Twitter, we'd love to see your comments and we could read your comments on the screen here, what you're feeling about the Drew Holiday contract, your thoughts about what it might mean for the future of the Celtics, and obviously um, your thoughts on Drew this year and the what it means for the Celtics and the vibes moving forward into the playoffs. Yeah. So as we're recording this right now, it's a few hours here before the Celtics take on the Knicks, their third to last game of the season. Um, as I talked about, looks like Drew Holiday may sit this one out. The latest update that we have at the time of this recording, uh, he's listed as questionable um, along with it looks like Al Horford is also questionable. Chris Stapps is questionable. Tillman, Brissett questionable does look like oh excuse me no Horford is not no longer questionable it's like Horford Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are available to play tonight so Drew Chris Stapps Tillman Brissett all listed as questionable so I think the Celtics you'll see down the stretch here once again gonna continue to do maybe three in three out whatever it might be um, to make sure that we get to the finish line healthy but health is where we want to go next Greg and we're going to get to the playoff scenarios here that exist because basically only the Celtics have actually definitively clinched what exact C they're going to be in the NBA, which is insane because there's three days left of the NBA season and the Celtics are going to be the one seed out West. The Clippers and the Mavericks are locked into the four five matchup, but we don't know who's four and who's five. And basically everywhere else has at least three teams that could end up in a certain seed, but starting in the East here, obviously we didn't, Come on, we didn't do a post game the other night for Celtics Bucks. The biggest news out of that one, 2 2 series, Celtics Bucks. But the biggest news out of that one was Giannis leaving that game uh, with a calf injury. Um, since they have done some MRIs, doesn't look like he avoided any type of structural damage. Um, however, he is done for the rest of the regular season. So, no, no Giannis the rest of the way here as the Bucks look to lock up the two seed. And, you know, based on some comments Doc Rivers had earlier today, sounds like they don't really know what to expect other than they're hoping that the rest of this week, plus the couple, the six or so days they're going to get next week, uh, not being in the play in tournament that they'll get is that hopefully in the next 10 days or so, just rest and rehab are going to be what gets the job done for Giannis. But, you know, Greg, what is this? How does this reshape your opinion of the Bucks, knowing that very likely, even if Giannis suits up for game one, he's probably not at a hundred percent and in a type of, you know, a calf strain. Like I, you know, obviously not, not breaking news here. We're not doctors, but <laughs> I would imagine that's an injury that tends to linger around a bit and, and is one that can, you know, certainly not allow Giannis to be at his full capabilities. Right. And for those of uh, you that are listening on the pod and don't have the visual up here on the screen, I just want to read a tweet from, um, at the Buck Zone IG verified account, so you know it's you know it's legit. Um, it says Chris Haynes on Giannis Antetokounmpo's left calf injury. From the people I've spoken to, there the Bucks not overly concerned about it. They do believe they will have him Giannis back for the playoffs. Hashtag fear the deer. Um, not fearing the deer at this point. Not fearing the deer. I I don't think we were you know, providing any uh, groundbreaking analysis when we say that the Bucks are not the same team without Yantas and Kumpo. Although my guy, Bobby Portis, Crazy Eyes Portis, went off last night and was able to help the Bucks pretty much secure the two seed with his 30-point uh, double-double that he had last night against the Magic. The Magic are the team that might slip down, you know, might slip down the standings. Oh, I, they got we, the, we've got percentages coming up here in a minute. It is, we've it got is, the Sixers and the Bucks, was man. A big loss 
for the Magic as far as what their future could look like. Last night, if they had got that win, I don't know what the numbers would have been, but they would have been a game back of the Bucks. And now they're almost nearly as likely to be the seven seed as they are anywhere from about four to six. So that was a really big loss for the Tough Magic. And, and the thing is, I mean, they didn't have Franz, but obviously the Bucks didn't have Giannis. The Bucks didn't have Middleton either in that game. So it was just yeah. big Bobby Portis night. Dame had a solid night. And uh, yeah, so the to the point of going back to just Giannis here, you know, last year against the Heat, Giannis goes down. Was it game one or game two that he went down with that with that back injury? I think injury? it was game one. I want to. I think it, it might have been, been game one as well, too. Yeah. And so I know, I know, I know the the stat is that he only played half of the available minutes in that series. And so we know if you take Giannis out, you know the the Heat as hot as they were, they made very quick work of the Giannis mm-hmm. Bucks. Right, that was a five game series. Uh, and so if you take him off this team, especially, which as we have harped on a ton on this show, the diminished or inconsistent Chris Middleton, because we have we saw a, a hot second where I was like, ah, shit, maybe this X factor of Chris Middleton's back. And then uh, since then, it's dipped down again. So I don't know what to get from Chris Middleton. Dame, I think, has been an aged version of himself. I still think in the last three to five minutes, underwhelming. I still think in the last three to five minutes, you can get some vintage Dame, and that's where if they keep it close, it would be a scary proposition, mm-hmm. but you remove Giannis and if he's not at a hundred percent with potentially a rematch with the heat or drawing the Sixers. Now with the other guy on our graphic here, Joel Embiid back, the bucks are in a position where they could be looking at back to back first round exits. That's kind of crazy to think about for, for this or for that organization, for, for all the, you know, the crazies out there that talk about, you know, if the Celtics don't win a title there, they might have to trade some guys and blow it up with the Bucks. If they don't win this year, man, they went all in on Dame Lillard. Like they don't really have another outlet for them to be a successful franchise. They've got, they've got one nuclear device and that's Giannis. That's trading Giannis. That's, yeah. that's the only, that's the only blow it up option that there is. Right. And that, that's starting over from scratch, which, you know, they're going to scratch and claw not to do ever. Cause why mm-hmm. wouldn't you trade a top five guy? Right. But with um, going back to the calf strain, I think with uh, I think it was Marcus Smart maybe had a calf strain two three years ago. We ended up missing like a That's full right. month going into the playoffs, like right around the playoffs. Um, I want to say KG one of his injuries back in the day was a calf strain as well, or no, it was Shaq. Right? Didn't Shaq have that calf strain where he just couldn't play? Um, I'm pretty sure. Is, is, is this the one where, like, the same season we traded? Obviously, we traded Perk, and I think yeah. Danny Ainge even asked him, like, "Can you hold up?" Shaq said no, and then Danny Ainge still made the trade. Yeah, but that was a calf strain. You know, obviously, yeah. he has um, about a hundred pounds on Giannis to put on that calf strain, but he was unable to come back. Calf strains, just like hamstrings, can be really tricky. Um, if Giannis is a hobbled version of himself, or if he's eighty percent, or if he doesn't trust his athleticism out there on the court. Giannis is one of the best players in the NBA because of his physical prowess, right? Mm-hmm. He's he's not necessarily the most skilled um, big man out there. He's, he's going to overwhelm you with his physicality, yada, yada, yada. We all know how Giannis plays basketball. So if he can't go at 100%, the Bucs don't have a chance, man. They really don't. So um, at this point, if I'm a Bucks fan, I would feel – about as bad as if you told me I'm not even going to put it out there right now because I don't want. It. Yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't. I'm not, not going to say any time. words that could potentially uh, curse the Celtics. So I would feel bad if something happened to the Celtics. I'll just say that. Like, what, what, what is the? I, I can't, I can't. I was going to say, what's don't, the equivalent of Giannis going down? I'm, I'm saying it now. The I'm going to cut you. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cut you off here. So let's transition here before Greg puts his foot in his mouth and curses all of Boston Celtic Twitter and Boston Celtic fan nation here, but. Let, let's go to the Embiid side of this, right? Because Embiid's coming back from the injury. So yeah. these are the two big looming giants in the East that are looking over the Celtics playoff chances that we're going to get to here in a second. And, you know, the Sixers right now are on, I believe it's a six game win streak right now. Embiid's been back for four of those games. He's playing 30 minutes a game. He's shooting 51% from the field, 45% from three, 87% from the line. 30 points a game, 8.3 rebounds, 4.8 assists, 1.8 steals, 1.3 blocks. Does average five turnovers in this stretch, but 
those feel very Embiid like, right? Like that, you know, it hasn't been. Uh, I mean, it's been against Memphis. It's been a game against Detroit, but he did play, you know, OKC when they were missing some guys, and then Perfect a game against games Miami, to get him but, back into the swing of things, right? Though, right. If if you're the Sixers, you don't want to throw Embiid out there into like a super intense game. Um, Embiid which, also, which, which like, he did against Miami. That was a pretty intense game uh, about a week or so ago. Right, right. Yeah, but, you know, Miami's playing like shit right now, dude. I know that wasn't an intense wow. game, but Miami just doesn't look good at all. Um, I think with, with Embiid, I, I still feel the same way I've, I've felt. I think there's like the, I don't know if it's the DNA from, from our childhood of just always thinking something's going to go wrong with the Red Sox. But like... Isn't it amazing that, how that shit travels with you? Know, like it's the narrative still, is still there, man. So real quick. So I was trying to explain the other night um, when UConn won their their sixth yeah. title in the last 25 years. I was trying to explain to my fiance. I was like, all right. So like UConn, when they first won in 99, uh, my, my dad's side of my family is from Connecticut. And I remember this is like when you know I was nine, 10 years old this time. Like this was still like all we knew was losing. Patriots hadn't won yet. The Patriots went to that one Super Bowl, but they had generally been trashed. The Celtics have been trash in our lifetime in the 90s. The Sox were losers. The Bruins, not that I followed them a ton, but at that time I was young enough that if they were doing good, I probably would have been invested, but they hadn't won since like the 70s. So it really was around the time of that infamous Boston, I think it was in the Herald, they had like the Loserville cover that was, you know, just we're, we're a bunch of losers in this town when it comes to sports. And I remember uh, my grandmother, as the UConn parade was happening, she took pictures of the TV and then sent them to me because that was like the first time there was anything in the New England region that felt like, hey, we can win sports at a high level. Like, this is actually a thing that could happen. And of course, fast forward two years later and then to all where we are today, you know, that seems unfathomable. People that only think about Boston sports, like, oh, you're a Boston sports guy. It's like, listen, I know I was only 12, 13 years old before things change, but that DNA that you're talking about, I 100% connect and resonate with it. And it fully shapes my view on every single sports season that I go through, despite all the winning success that just does not leave you, especially when it's, you know, we've talked about before that that age range from your 10 to 12 or 13, that really shapes how yeah. you view yeah. and feel, feel about sports. And it continues to this day. So I think it's just funny how, you know, despite all the winning, we still can draw back to that connection of, uh, of despair. I think is the way to, that right. was constantly in the air growing up. Just like an overwhelming sense of impending doom and dread. Right. Is and it, that's it, kinda... it, as good as something is just, just wait, it's going to go wrong. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Murphy's law. Right. And with Embiid, I'm just thinking about from a six, I was talking with my buddy at work today, who's a Sixers fan and he's kind of given up hope. He's kind of in that like sweet spot as a fan to be like, Oh, it's just not going to happen this year, man. Like we, well, you know, too many injuries. It's just not going to happen. Embiid, you know, he's back, but is he really going to be a hundred percent? He's mm -hmm. always hurt. And he's just like talked himself into the lowest of expectations so that if they exceed those expectations it's going to be the right. best fucking playoffs of this kid's life and i'm just thinking like god damn there's a narrative out there where like this was what mb needed to make it through a playoffs was to be hurt coming into the playoffs and that's all i needed and this is this could be the year that joel mb just has the mb run where we look back 10 years 20 years from now and we're just like god damn mb was just that good and like it's the clash of the titans Jokic versus mb there is that narrative there i don't necessarily subscribe to it but the you know the little kid in me it's like fully believing that that's a possibility which just drives me crazy because the rational adult knows that the Sixers aren't on the same level as the Celtics right. and haven't been for many many years right but there's still just that part of me that is a little bit worried about that yeah and you know and, and sometimes those narratives mean absolutely nothing and then sometimes you get a whiff of it and you're like oh shit that momentum that momentum's real all of a sudden and to your point of being in that perfect fan zone you know, as Celtics fans, it's a gift and a curse because we came into this season with very high expectations. They've lived up to and, and to a certain degree exceeded them, just, except for the fact that they can't fully exceed them until this playoff, until the playoffs. Right. So everything's cool. It's like, oh, they've been a good regular season team for for many years now. When are they going to going to win it all? And so instead, as fans, we now live with, you know, last year down three two to the to the sixers and the text thread that shall never see the light of day between <laughs> me you and adam like 
that's what we live with as it where it's more almost relief than it is jubilation at certain points and so like you said your friend is in a very good spot where only good things can happen and if the worst happens it's what you expected you move on so it, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with them beating the sixers and that that leads us to where we want to take this podcast here and let's start talking about different playoff scenarios i mentioned at the top the east is just literally in shambles outside of the celtics knowing that they're going to be the one seed there's two things we know Celtics are going to be the one seed the hawks and the bulls are going to be in the play and we don't know who's hosting that that 9 10 soiree that's going to happen between the the bulls and the hawks but they will be the 9 10 two through eight we have no idea what is going to happen so let me just pull this up here real quick i want to get uh let's see here pull this up uh so i want to get this set up here with the with the post seed possibilities that we have here for the celtics so right now this is both the western and eastern conference that we have and i have some percentages that will go along with it but like i said we know the celtics are going to be the one seed for the two seed right now the bucks Knicks, and Cavs all still in play you mentioned it greg at this point with the bucks being the magic last night it's right now it's an 82 percent chance they're going to be the two seed so let's kind of remove that as a question mark that's of i would say that's now in the likely category with two to three games left to play for everybody go down to the three seed you still have five teams involved for the three seed bucks <laughs> Knicks, Cavs, magic pacers four seed those same teams still apply go all the way down to the five seed here You've got the Knicks, the Cavs, the Magic, the Pacers, the Sixers, and even the Heat still with a chance to get to the five seed. Very, very slim. The Heat are almost destined to be in the play-in at this point, but still a slim chance. Same same group of teams there for the six seed. And then you go down to the seven seed, and this is where it's so crazy. If you're the Cavs, you can be anywhere from the two to the seven seed. If you're the Magic, you can be anywhere from the three to the eight seed. Pacers, three through eight still in play. It is just an absolute mess right now. And I'm trying to think, and I I mean, I guess the Celtics haven't had too much to worry about in recent years, but I can't remember it being this messy this late where there's absolutely no way to do any type of jockeying, never mind the play in messing up jockeying. There's just, there's no jockeying that can be done for anybody here, you know, in the Eastern Conference. And the Western Conference goes for them too. Yeah, it's just been a lot of teams struggling, man. Like the Bucks losing all these games of late. The Cavs have been absolute dog shit of late. Um, you know, the Knicks, they've just been riddled with injuries, and Jalen Brunson keeps putting on that superhero cape, man. Jalen Brunson is unbelievable. By the way, I know you um you had mentioned on a recent pod whether Jalen Brunson would work his way into the first team on NBA discussion. Mm -hmm. Big Waz on the Ringer NBA show had him on his first team on NBA team. Yep. Uh, so just wanted to say if there's some if there's some people out there talking about it. So I wanted to give you some love for that. Um, and then let's see, just looking at this right here, man. Like my reaction to seeing this is just relief that the Celtics don't have to be a part of any of this stuff. <laughs> but it also gives me anxiety because we don't know who the hell we're going to play. Right. <laughs> it's like so many different op uh, options here for the Celtics to play. And um, you 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 had a little exercise you wanted to do. Do you want to do yeah, that right so now? Yeah, so let's let's okay. do this here. I'm gonna switch this up on us and let's get this on the screen here. Let's see what was the best one that we said was good for it. Yeah, this works here. All right, so I have the projected standings up here that has all of the percentages broken down. So Celtics got the one seed for this exercise. Let's say that the Bucks are going to get the two seed. So let's just eliminate that out of a possibility. The Bucks have the two seed wrapped up. What I want us to try to figure out here is within the realm of, of realistic possibility, what's the best way that this can break for the Celtics? So mm -hmm. if we're looking at this right now, the inside track to the third seed, technically it belongs to the Cavaliers as of this moment, but it looks like the Knicks could potentially be that three seed it looks like the Cavs would have the inside track to that four seed if we go down to the five seed here this is where it gets really interesting this Pacers Magic Sixers mess is where I think we're really going to see the most movement because the Sixers have an advantage over the Magic who they play on Friday night which will be you know a really high stakes game for both teams but if there's a Sixers Magic Pacers three way tie, the Magic then have certain tiebreakers that leave Philly at a disadvantage to fall back in to the seven seed. So as we're looking at these realistic possibilities, Greg, let's let's just go seed by seed and 
you know, I want to use the probability projections here just to give us like, all right, if it's, you know, it's only about a 0.5% chance the Cavaliers can end up, it's less than 1% chance they end up in the play-in. Let's eliminate the Cavaliers as a play-in team, right? Like that's not a likely scenario. So that's okay. not going to be something that I think we should, we should look to here. But if we want this to break correctly for the Celtics, who do you think you'd want to see end up in this three seed realistically right now? In the three seed? So I'm, I'm, I just want to go C by C. That's okay. that's the point. Is I want to go C by C for this. Um, I think with the Cavs struggling to the degree that which they're struggling, I would probably want to see the Knicks because OG is back and we, we, we weren't really sure what OG status would be. I'd probably want to avoid the Knicks until the Eastern Conference uh, final. So I would prefer that the Knicks stay out of that four or five and are on the other side of the bracket. So I would want the Knicks at the three seed. How about you? I agree. I think that makes the most sense. And especially for where I think we're going to get to with what the uh, either two, seven with the two, seven matchup or the three, six could look, or yeah, but the two, seven matchup could look like, I agree with you. Cause I think the Knicks then going on to the, to the second round and being someone that the Celtics can avoid until the conference finals. I think that makes a lot of sense. So now that puts the Knicks in the three seed. Now let's go down to the four seed right now. And for the four seed, the Cavaliers are still in play. This is still an option. For the Magic and the Pacers, not going to be an option for the Sixers. So let's just say we have the Cavs, the Pacers, and the Magic looking in that four seed and remembering that that 4-5 winner is going to be who the Celtics would get in the second round. Out of those three teams, who would you lean towards as the ideal candidate to end up in that four seed? Probably the Cavs. Um, I don't think the Cavs could beat us like in any situation. I think there's a world in which the Knicks beat the Celtics. Um, I think there's a world in which even the Pacers beat the Celtics. It's a weird world. It's a world I, I probably <laughs> would never want to set foot in. Um, but I do think there is a world in which the Pacers could somehow beat the Celtics. I really don't think the Cavs have any chance of beating the Celtics. Um, so I would want the Cavs in the four seed for sure. So they have home court advantage that gives them a, a chance to to a better chance to beat whoever ends up in the five seed. And when I say the Knicks and the Pacers have a chance to beat the Celtics, I mean like a 0.001% chance, but I think there's, I literally cannot envision like the Dean Wade game. happening. I was going to say, are you, are you not afraid of Dean row. Wade? Are you not <laughs> like afraid I just of Dean Wade, Greg? I don't see that happening. I do right. see Tyrese Halliburton going crazy for a series. Aaron Neesmith taking out somebody's legs. Um, TJ McConnell, <laughs> just like, yeah, I, I think for any of these series, the mental hospital, you know, a, a, like, any of these series without Embiid, Siakam, like I, I, I haven't watched him as much with Siakam. I think a lot of these series would need injuries from the Celtics, other than yeah, yeah, yeah. if Philly were hitting right, if the Bucks were hitting right. There's worlds in which those teams at full strength would have enough talent and depth, theoretically, to match up with the Celtics if they were having, you know, an off series. I think everybody else, it would have to be some type of injury that would prevent the Celtics from moving on. But okay, so let's lock in the Knicks at three, Cavs at four. That brings us to the five seed here where we have the mostly at this point, we're looking at the Pacers in the magic with the most, with the likeliest of probabilities to end up in that five seed. Which of those would you want to see as the Cavaliers opponent, knowing that one of those two teams would wait for Boston? Would you rather for what you're saying here, would it be the Pacers with Tyrese Halliburton, Pascal Siakam, crazy man, Aaron Neesmith, or is it the young guns, Paolo, Franz, the length of Jonathan Isaac? Who would you <laughs> like to see in that five seed? Um, I, for me, I think neither of those teams are going to beat us. I know I just said there's a world in which the Pacers could beat us. Um, I kind of want just entertainment here. So if we're going to have the Cavs in that four seed and we have the Knicks in the three seed, I'm also thinking about who I want to see match up with those teams. Um, and I think it would probably be the most fun if the Cavs were playing the Magic and the Knicks were playing the Pacers. I think that would be the most fun for me. But um, yeah, your thoughts. I'm with you on that. And also Pacers Knicks gives us a little bit of throwback to the nineties, right? Like we had, right. we had yeah. some Nick T last year, get a little Pacers Knicks. I, I kind of like that vibe as well. Cavs magic. Uh, I, I'll tell you right now, I think there's a good chance if it's Cavs magic, despite that being a four or five seed. And usually it's an eight, one or a seven, two matchup that ends up as the NBA TV special. 
I guarantee you Cavs Magic end up as the NBA TV special. And I guarantee that you I will be telling all the people that still bet to bet the under. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That series is going to be so ugly. But yes, I'm with you. I, I think that that works out. The one thing I will reserve. So I, I'm with you on the Magic in the five seed. What I think, and I think this, if the Magic do end up with that five seed, it's going to basically eliminate the Sixers getting to the six seed, which is one of the parts that I'm would be the only thing that would change my mind about having the Pacers as the five seed. Is that I think that would then open up the possibility of Philly getting to six. And then, therefore, you're going to have them with the Knicks playing in that first round. And then the winner of Philly in um, Philly in New York would then take on Milwaukee. So, therefore, I think you're then putting all three of the Celtics' probably biggest hurdles on the same side of the bracket to knock each other out. And then there's only one of them left. And they're, they're beaten up, likely, which kind of Philly and in Milwaukee. Well, actually, all three of them are kind of coming and beaten up anyways, but they beat up on each other a little bit more. So that would be my only thing about pay, whether it makes more sense for the Pacers to get the five seed so that it opens up the possibility of Philly squeezing into that six. Yeah. And then in that scenario, you'd be left with a Magic and Heat play-in game for the winner of that goes on to play the Bucks. And then you would get, obviously, the loser of that takes on the winner of Hawks Bulls. So which of those scenarios do you think? Now that I'm just talking it out here more, has that does that change the, your mind dude, at all? This about is like you doing think? a freaking crossword puzzle. It's um, tough. <laughs> but I think I would probably, well, in terms of matchups, I think it would be really fun to see if the Knicks are in the three seed, Knicks and Sixers would be really fun to watch. But I also think having Doc go up against the Sixers would be really fun. In the two seven matchup with the Sixers being there, um, and then immediately having one of the two big men just knocking each other out in the first round, I think is probably ideal for for the Celtics. Um, so I think I'd probably prefer that man. I think I, I the Sixers being the seven seed, beating the Heat, right, sending the Heat spiraling into a matchup, a rematch maybe against um, against either the Hawks or the Bulls, right? Because they lost to the Hawks right. and they beat the Bulls, so. And that's the wild card in all of this is that like I think we're gonna have to become Hawks Bulls fans for whatever that Friday night Trey Young game looks like. Trey Young is back, so we'll have to see you know how that looks. But you know, like you said, to your point that this is like a Sudoku or a crossword puzzle trying to figure out all the scenarios is that the own my own scenario that I laid out of like, well, if the Sixers get the six seed, that still applies if they actually get the seven seed because then they just play the Bucks in the first round, and then likely they would play if the Knicks win they would play the Knicks in the next round anyway. So right, right, that right. same logic applies, but it's just so it's uh, it's so muddled that it like, it gets confusing to try to figure out which is which. So I don't know, man, a lot, a lot of moving pieces here at the end of the day, I think for the Celtics, you know, first round number one, ID ideal situation, the bulls or Hawks pulling upset. That's the number one ideal situation for, for the first round ideal situation. Number two, do you like you said, Heat are playing bad? Do you want to just play the Heat, or would you rather take your chances with uh, most likely the Sixers or Magic? How would you rank those three teams? If if the Bulls, the, I don't want to play the Sixers out. in the first round, okay, just because Fair of enough. the the little kid dread that we talked about earlier. I just yeah. don't want to see that. Um, and then Heat I Magic think, would be the other two. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably rather play the Magic, but there's something about me that knows we're better than the Heat. And I just mm -hmm. want to like whoop that ass one time and sweep him out of the playoffs and like make Jimmy Butler. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to like send him spiraling into a depression, but I just want to, sh I just want to shut him the fuck up, dude. Have like, you Jimmy seen his but new commercial with, um, uh, with Jeffrey from uh fresh Prince of Bel-Air? No, they have some like Hulu commercial where, uh, it talks about like Jimmy going in motherfucker playoff mode and, yeah, it, the, all the sentiments that you're saying right now, you're going to feel it five to ten times more after you see that commercial. Okay, because like the competitor in me want like, you know, when you're a fan, you're watching the game and you could you want to like punch the fucking television. I'm like, that's how I feel when I think about the heat. I just like I want to get in there and scrap with the team. Mm -hmm. um, if we lose to the heat, I don't think I could handle it. That's the thing. Like if we if we lost to the magic. I don't even know how, how what I would do. Like, but if we lost to the Heat, 
that would send me spiraling into a deep depression, honestly. Right. Like, well, like well, I, I would be struggling, dude. As you were saying, let's get this done with and let's let's whoop that ass with the with the heat in the first round. It made me think, because right, like the the two teams that Miami has kind of plagued and terrorized has been us and the Bucks, right? Those are the two teams that they keep two teams they also of. lost to in the playoffs. Right. And and that's where I was going with this. So yeah. if you remember the heat, the Bucks were, I believe, the one seed in the bubble, right? And that's mm-hmm. when the the heat pull off the upset ends up being Celtics heat uh in the bubble conference finals and that was the Celtics really being probably a year ahead of schedule especially mm-hmm. with the the Kemba knee injury and that was you yeah, know it, yeah. it was all a little bit Gordon uh yeah a little bit of a mess in that in that situation but that next Daniel year tight start and center that's when yeah Daniel, a lot of <laughs> Daniel Tice in that a lot of Grant, Grant Williams as a rookie was shooting major free throws I remember that uh and so the next year that's when the Bucks came back on their revenge tour after it was like I don't know man Giannis got two MVPs but he can't get it done in the they playoffs swept him, right? that's my point first yeah. round first round came back and swept that ass so that's kind of the precedent for the Celtics here is you know listen this was what Milwaukee had to go through when they won the championship. They had the same demon of the heat kind of lingering over them like, hey, they're coming again. They already got us. Well, they took care of business real quick in that first round. That could be the same setup for the Celtics this year. Yo, let's get the heat in. We know that we're better. We know that especially with Chris Dapps in here, you don't got the size. You don't got the weapons. You don't got the tools. This is a different team, and we're going to send a message not just to you but to the league that – we mean business and let's go on a run here in the Eastern conference. So uh, I'm with you. I, I think it would probably be from the scenario perspective. Number one, bulls Hawks. Just give me that. Just give me, give me those. I'm very happy to take those. Number two, if somehow it ends up with the magic, that would be preferable. But then three, give me the heat over the Sixers. And if it's the heat, let it be the heat. Let's do this thing. You know, it's crazy. I remember being 16 years old. Will, so we would have, that would have been like, um, what? Well, nine, well, 16 years after, so we would have been 13 years old. So 16 years after the Celtics won the title in 1986, mm-hmm. right? Um, we're just we're just like thinking, we're thinking about how long it takes for championships to happen. So from 1986 to 2008, right? That's 22 mm-hmm. years. Yeah. Now from the Celtics title, 2008 to 2024, it's been 16 years. So That's can great. you imagine? You imagine like. Being 16 years old or 13 years old, you know, after the um, after the last title, and just remembering how you felt about how long it had been since the Celtics won a title, like for 16 year olds today, like that's how they feel, man. Right. You know, it's like it must feel like forever, even though we've been in the in the finals a couple times. Like it was, it seems so foreign to me that the Celtics could have been in the finals or could have been a good team because we were born in 1989. <laughs> right we've come we've, we've come a so long like, way from that from those early days yeah man so it's just like so strange to me to think like it does it, the 2008 championship feels like yesterday mm-hmm. but in reality it's actually like kind of a long time like the Celtics right. like, need to win this like, like, like i mean i know you're about to have a baby but if you think about it like just from from that perspective they're like a junior in high school or like a sophomore right. in high school right 16 year old something like that like that's crazy. That's a that's that's a long time for it to have been between championships, especially for like this franchise that you know it felt like in the you know 60s, 70s, 80s. This is just that's all that's how, that's what life is, right? Life is just going to the NBA finals multiple times per decade, winning multiple championships per decade. And now it's you know, it's it's been what since 86, it's been three three finals appearances and one championship, like since 86. Mm-hmm. So and we were lucky, uh, like, obviously we had all the Red Sox titles and all the Patriots titles. So we were spoiled with right. that e- even after the, the Celtics won. But like, man, it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while. Been a it's title. time to change it. It's time to change it. So I think this is the year we'll know more come Sunday afternoon. So Celtics play tonight against the Knicks. Uh, they've got Friday night against the Charlotte Hornets. And then again, 
they will have the Washington Wizards and Mike Gorman's farewell call on Sunday afternoon. Uh, all of the East teams play matinees on Sunday that have games remaining, that is. And so after the Celtics conclude their game, uh, everyone should be wrapping up right around that time. We'll know what that chaos of the standings that we just went through. We'll know what it actually looks like uh, sometime Sunday afternoon. So we'll probably wait for that all that mess to clear up. Uh, and then we'll put together some analysis. And of course, we'll talk about Mike Gorman's uh, final call, man. It feels kind of crazy. Mike, Mike Gorman, he of the Green with Henry intro. That's right. He of the Green with Envy intro. Uh, Green with Envy fame, shall we say, for Mike Gorman. Uh, makes his last call and then hands over uh, his mic to Drew Carter starting next year. So that will be a little bit emotional on Sunday. We'll talk about some of our favorite Mike Gorman moments. We'll talk about what we know for the Eastern Conference playoffs since it will be more definitive at that time. Uh, but as always, Greg, this is fun, man. These live streams, I love doing them every single Thursday. We're going to keep doing them through the playoffs as well, so make sure that you guys are locked in with us. Uh, if it's the night of a game, it will probably be mostly focused as a preview podcast or a preview stream where we'll get you set up for that night's action. Um, but we'll have it for you every Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central. Uh, any final thoughts here, Greg, before we uh, wind this one up? Are you coming to watch UFC 300 with me this weekend? Uh, I've thought about it. I'll probably stop by to say what's up. I have zero clue as to what's going on. I saw a, uh, a headline that Dana White said this was basically every match is supposed to be like a headliner, like the equivalent of like it could be a UFC yeah. headliner. I have no idea if that's true or not. Um, I might co I might come by for an hour or two and just check out the vibes. But uh, I probably I don't know. How, how late is that? does, does UFC 300 go? Um, they, they do it at UFC operates on its own world. So I don't know what time the time. Well, it's in is. Vegas. Um, so probably be done around midnight here. Okay. I might, but it starts at like 4 p.m., right? Yeah, it'll either start at four or five. A, that time. seems so excessively long. Um, okay, I'll I'll probably stop by for a little bit to check out the vibe. So I'll have to, I'll I'll give everybody that's listening uh, my uneducated thoughts on UFC 300. Come, that'd soon. be a fun little segment, man. There's not much basketball to talk about, so. Yeah, so that will be that'll be one of our segments for Sunday. Uh, but that's going to do it for this live stream. As always, we appreciate you guys rocking with us. Appreciate you guys checking in. Uh, let's hit you with some Black Sheep Optimus, and we'll catch you guys on Sunday. It's the end of the regular season. Let's gear up for the playoffs. Till I hit the floor Every time I get this high It's you I find It don't take much no more Until I'm at your door to my core, baby. What can I say? You got me on the floor. You know I came to play. I know I shouldn't, but you seem to take my pain away. And every time I score, Jason Tatum fade away. I close my eyes and I'm 